I guess my question is, is 2024 the year in which at least we come to a temporary pause in hostilities, or is 2024 the year in which things escalate? I think and I hope that Israel will use 2024 to transition from their high-intensity approach that they're doing at the moment with lots of airdrops, munitions, artillery and all the rest of it to a much lower-intensity uh, approach to where... Uh, and it takes a lot more time, it's a lot more dangerous for them, but where they take more time looking after the hearts and minds of the uh, Palestinian people and they can still very slowly work their way through um, Gaza to get rid of Hamas in the same way that uh, the approach by the British in Northern Ireland changed from um, a relatively high-intensity military-focused approach to a, an aiding the civil powers approach. There's no civil powers in uh, in Gaza, and therefore Israel would have to try and create that. So there's 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 several layers of difficulty that are there that haven't been experienced beforehand. Uh, and then the international community, to, a success in 2024 will be stopping any escalation elsewhere. Um, and within that, you're stopping Putin escalate or having further successes in Ukraine and stopping escalation of um, what Iran's trying to do uh, across the whole of the Middle East region. Um, just before I let you go, let's just update on Ukraine. You said it's not on the front pages. Uh, it, it isn't really. Um, I'm assuming that we've now reached this element of stalemate. Um, President Zelensky clearly looking for continued Western support. Uh, if that doesn't happen, I'm assuming Russia could win just by attrition. We're, we all get bored of it. Um, Ukraine runs out of weapons, munitions, people. Um, Putin gets his way. Well, when we look at things from a one-dimensional perspective, i.e. how much the front line has moved, um, then uh, we can say that they're still met. If we look at it in a slightly more complex way um, uh, and what Ukraine is managing to achieve um, uh, two-dimensionally or three-dimensionally um, into Russia, you know, we've just seen the Ukrainians uh, uh, destroy another capital ship. Um, overall, it's destroyed about 20% of the Black Sea fleet. Ukraine doesn't have a navy. Um, uh, that, that's a huge success. Ukraine is hollowing out the Russians from behind um, and undermining the very foundations the Russians have built their um, uh, their special military operation on. Um, that is a huge success. And I think we'll see an increase of that with Ukrainian attacks uh, using special operations, executive type tactics into Russia itself, across Crimea more. And what that'll do is it'll weak, weaken Russia's ability to reinforce its frontline activity. Russia's losing about a thousand troops a day um, at the moment on the front line. That's unsustainable. And then we compare the ability to support this. Um, Russia is already having to turn to North Korea to supply its ammunition. It can't supply it from its own domestic capability. Ukraine is getting ammunition and equipment from all of the different Western countries that are out there. The F-16s are just about to appear. More weapons are coming in. Western Defence Industrial Base has been ramped up to be able to supply them um, more ammunition. It's It's been slow in getting there, and that's what's caused a few problems at the moment. But the M1 Abrams tanks are just starting to come into Ukraine. Um, Ukraine is growing militarily while Russia's been weakened. So I, I, I wouldn't quite say there's, there's stalemate. The front line has moved, but it's definitely not stalemate. Definitely not stalemate. Well, I guess we're going to have interesting times ahead in 2024. Plenty of conflict still oh, yes. to cover. Uh, Philip Ingram, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us.